Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Agazi, and I'm the Teacher Development Manager for Macmillan Education International Curriculum. Today, we have Andrew Jeffrey, who is our Singapore maths expert, who's waving at you there. We will be delivering a session focusing on bar modeling techniques. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in the questions or the chat box that you see, um, and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions throughout the session. And I will give it, pass it over to Andrew now. Thank you. Thanks, Rhina. Thank, and hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or even good evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for taking your time out to join us today. I hope you're going to enjoy this uh, short session. Right, so um, much more uh, compelling than looking at me is uh, look at these slides. So let's do exactly that. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce you to this idea of bar modeling now, and uh, it will be really useful to know um, how much you guys know. And obviously, there's literally several hundred of you on this call, which is really exciting. Um, but I, it'd be nice to know roughly what you know. So uh, I want you to, in the chat box, put one of three things. Would you either put um, um, nothing, or some, or lots, depending on your current knowledge? So just, just write nothing or a little or a lot, if you like, just just so I can kind of read those. I can see your comments coming through. So I've got quite a few nothings, some sums. Uh, someone can't see anything. You've got the best of both worlds there probably. Oh, there's someone with a lot, good. You can take a zero, there we are. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna assume a fairly lowish level of knowledge, but even those of you who've been bar modeling for a while, I hope you're gonna find something useful that you can take back. Uh, if you want a screenshot and share, that'd be fine. Um, take notes, whatever you want to do. Right, let's get into an introduction. So the first thing is that bar models are simply pictures that students draw to help them solve word problems. Okay, that's the first thing they do. Um, and it allows them to reason, and it's supported by uh, concrete, we don't literally mean concrete, practical resources, physical, some people call them manipulatives, things like counters, uh, cards, uh, cubes, dice, whatever. Um, <clears throat> okay, excuse me. And now, when we talk about bars, we mean representations of quantities. So a bar, a strip, horizontal strip, just is just about representing uh, a numerical amount or a quantity, and it can be divided into several equal or unequal pieces. And you can solve a number of algebraic um, or uh, quantity problems with it. So um, often, um, not, not in this webinar, which is, uh, which is the introduction session, but maybe in a future one, if you're interested, we'll look at um, how to get around uh, solving equations or at least visualizing the solving of equations uh, with um, uh, bar modeling, which is great. But for now, we're going to stick to uh, the, the basics. Now, Daniel Willingham said it's uh, a metaphor for the abstract. The concrete is a metaphor for the abstract. So, um, what by that he means is uh, when you think about numbers, if you think about numbers, actually, you've got to say, how? what are they? I mean, they're very difficult concepts, aren't they? They're, they're generalizations. And, and for young children working with numbers, that, that can be quite a challenge. So, let's... Um, Let's use something physical, like you use fingers to start with their counting, don't they? All right, uh, and and so that's that's something that we should encourage, not discourage. All right, um, so let's have, have a look at a question. How I want you to have a crack at this question for me. Um, it's a question from about ten years ago, uh, exactly ten years ago, uh, next month, and it was set to just to give you some context. Eleven-year-old children um, in England here in England where I'm based. So 11 year old children, uh, not a tricky question, I thought so. Have a crack at it, read the question yourself and then um, put the answer in the chat box or put your answer in the chat box. Let's just wait and see what comes up. Okay, I'm seeing a pattern here. I've got a few people on. I've got some 24, 6, 34. Okay, don't worry if you're not if you're not feeling brave enough to do it. That's absolutely fine. Just uh, don't worry. Just take part. 
Okay, so um, the answer is 24. Well done. And here's uh, how you do it. If you see that a quarter of the class are boys, the key is realizing that therefore um, the other three quarters are girls. And uh, <coughs> excuse me, so that three quarters of the class are girls, and that's represented by the number 18 there. So now I think about three quarters, and I think that three quarters is worth 18. So to find what one quarter is, I have to divide 18 into three parts, giving me six. And that's a quarter of the class. So if six is a quarter of something, I multiply by four, and that gives me 24 for the whole class. So think about this for a second. What you needed to do to get this right was 18 divided by three equals six, and six times four equals 24. Now, I don't know what the, what the, the standard of uh, mathematics in your uh, country is, but I'm guessing that almost all 11-year-olds would know that 18 divided by 3 was 6, and 6 times 4 was 24. So let me ask you to guess. I've put a little question at the bottom of the slide. I don't know if you can see that. OK. Um, what percentage of pupils got this right? What percentage of pupils got this right? And I want you to put a guess. I'll give you a clue. It's between one and a hundred. It's not a great clue. Okay. What percentage of pupils got this right? Who's going to have a little guess first? Look in the chat. Here we go. 75%? Yep. 90%? 58%? Okay. Someone say, where is the comment? I don't understand that question. Um, You've written in the box. Okay, well, you'll be at 5%. You'll be amazed to know that uh, Boomi Joe is right, okay, or nearly right, anyway. The answer is stunningly less than 4%, okay? Let's, um, oh, hang on, where are we? Uh, there it is, just less than 4%. How could that be? How could that be? You just need to do 18 divided by 3 and uh, multiply by 4, right? Well, the problem is not doing the multiplication. The problem is, or the division, the problem is knowing what division and multiplication to do. Okay, so uh, let me just go back one step, uh, and show you the picture. Right, this is, this is how a child who'd been taught to bar model would draw this picture, would solve this problem. They would draw the class represented by a bar, and they would say, okay, so I know that this class is in quarters, so I'm going to put a bar divided into quarters. What's more, I know that um, one of the quarters is boys, so I'm going to put a B in one of the boxes. And if I put a B there, then I must put a G in all of these. These must be girls. But hang on, I know that there are 18 here. So I've got to split that 18 into those three boxes, so that's six per box. So the answer is four sixes, which is 24. Okay. And I think that's really helpful. Okay, I think that's really helpful. Um, but, uh, oh, hang on, I'm just going to go back a step. Um, right, I, I, I wonder if you've been taught um, to, 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 to do the question by just looking for key information. One of the problems with this is that one of the key numbers in this, three, is um, is not a, it, it's not in the question. Look, there's no there's no sense of three there. There's no sense of dividing, uh, so it actually doesn't say uh, three in there. And so just looking for the key numbers in the question isn't going to help you do this. And that's why I think so many of our children got it wrong. I have to be honest. In the last ten years, there's been much progress in this kind of reasoning teaching, and I suspect that number would be a lot higher than four percent this time. All right, let me skip on. Okay. Uh, to here. Now, when we are using um, math equipment, we, <coughs> excuse me, when we're using math equipment, um, we, we like to introduce bar modeling using cubes. And there are two types of cubes. Now, in my, uh, in my country, uh, they're called unifix or multi-link, but let me just uh, try and explain what the difference is. The ones that we call unifix you can only make one straight line out of them. They only join at the top and the bottom, in other words. Whereas multi-link can be clipped together on all six faces. 
and I'm going to suggest, oh, I don't know about your classroom, but in every classroom I've ever been into that has cubes, there's a big tray, and it, they're all mixed up. There's Unifix and Multilink mixed up. And you've probably got that, and you've probably got some of those little triangle pieces as well that no one's quite sure what to do with. That seems to be the way. But I, I recommend that you, you just keep the Unifix ones for bar modeling, because you don't have to go into uh, different dimensions for this. You just need to stick to a straight line. All right, it's less distracting. The boys can't make guns and weapons and swords if they can only go in one straight line, so that's good. Okay, uh, so that's a really important point. Now, the next uh, next one, I want to ask you a question. Has anyone heard of this method? It's an English language method, okay, uh, for, t for solving word problems. Okay. Right, let's play a game with Family Fortunes. So, which of these things do you think are good? Do you know what they stand for? Just in case you've not heard of this, um, it was a sort of six step method that was recommended for, for tackling word problems. But having struggled with this for a few years, I, I realized that it was pretty flawed and I've managed to work out why it's flawed as well. So, let's see which of these represents good advice. Firstly, read the question. It stands for underline the key information, choose a calculation, solve the problem, answer the question, and check your solution. Now, that on the face of it sounds like pretty good advice, but let's see. Um, read the question, you're not gonna get any argument from me. There we go, that's definitely right. But then, then underline the key information. Well, straight away, straight away you can see a problem with that advice from the question we just looked at, because one of the key numbers in that question is three, and it just doesn't appear. We can't solve that problem unless we divide 18 by three, but there is no three. Um, other other uh, flaws with underlying key information is that early on, children are taught words uh, that, that mean things, and words like um, more than, or times, all right? But what if, um, what if I have five sweets, and that is two more than you, what do you have? Now you and I know the answer is three, but to a child following this advice, they'll underline five and uh, more than, and I can't remember if I said two or three, but you see the problem, they're just gonna add and get to seven or eight, whatever it was. Yeah, so that doesn't really work, because it's okay to tell me to underline the key information, um, what about Mrs. Um, Mrs. Moore is eating a takeaway while reading the Times and checking their share prices? I mean, I can spot all four calculation methods in there, so I'm not going to allow underline. I don't think that's a very helpful thing to say to children um, before you've told them what the key information is. And then the next one is choose a calculation. But again, it doesn't tell you how. That's like saying, make the right choice here without giving you any sense of how to make the right choice. So you may as well just toss a coin and go, oh, division, okay. Not a fan. Solve, if you can solve it, you can solve it. But just telling me to solve it doesn't really tell me how to solve it, but I, I take the fact that you do have to solve it. Um, and then write the answer down. The number of, you'll know, you'll have students, the number of students who you, who do all the work and then forget to write the answer. So write the answer, definite. Okay, check. Uh, let's play a little game in the chat box. Um, check, good idea or bad idea? Can you just write a G or a B? Ramnick can't hear the audio. That's okay, someone, someone will be working on that for you. Rhino's working behind the scenes. So I'm looking for G or B. Most people are going for G. One or two people have realized that actually it's a complete, <laughs> okay, yeah, now this is quite controversial, here we go, thanks, thanks. I'm gonna say, um, <coughs> have, you, have you ever been uh, written a, a school report or something and then your, um, your manager gives it back to you with a spelling mistake or a grammar error? That's kind of embarrassing, right? And you go, what, I checked that, I checked that so carefully. Um, and the reason is this, the brain that makes a mistake is the same brain that, that didn't realize it was a mistake in the first place. So when it's looking for a mistake, it's not going to spot its own mistake. Those of us who are in relationships, you will know this. Um, it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek, but it's very easy to spot other people's mistakes, right? 
Okay, but spotting our own mistakes can sometimes be a bit more difficult. And so it is with children's work. They, they wrote what they thought was right at the time. They've got the same mind as the one they had when they wrote it. So I can be honest with you, only twice in 20 years have I had a chance to say to me, oh, Mr. Jeffrey, thank you so much for making me check my work. Because I found a mistake in question five, line two, look at this. It just hardly happens. Um, however, um, the lesson we can learn from relationships is swap books, swap books to check, all right? Other people's work is much easier to check than your own. Uh, so check, I'm sorry, it's, it just doesn't really work. Um, check someone else's, whole different board game. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm getting, I've seen one or two people saying, I can't hear audio or see video. I think most people can. So I'm guessing that might be an issue to your end, but uh, I know that Reiner is working on that for you. So I'm just gonna press on, don't think I'm ignoring you. Okay, um, right, here's an example then. Here's an example of a question, a very silly question. It's often math questions are very silly, I've noticed that. Uh, so here's Boris and Angela share hats in the ratio of five to two. If Angela has 18 fewer hats than Boris, how many hats does Boris have? Now, if you are a child looking at a question like that, your brain is just going to blow up, right? There's, there's, how do I even attack this question? And uh, ratios is one of those topics that absolutely brilliantly lends itself to a bar model. So I'm going to show you how a child who'd been trained to bar model would find this problem very straightforward. Here we go. Um, I'm going to use coloured counters. Now, um, I love, as one of my favourite teaching tools when I'm in classrooms, I love uh, using counters which are different colours on each side. So uh, I've got some you know, yellow on one side and red on the other. And I'm simply going to make it, uh, draw a picture. Okay, there's my picture of, um, I see people are starting to put answers in already for their hat, that's interesting. Um, draw a picture of uh, what I think the question is saying. Now, can you see the first sentence, Boris and Angela share hats in the ratio of five to two? Can you see what I've done? Is I've just put five blobs there and two blobs there. Now, it's important to state here, a blob doesn't equal a hat. But what it allows me to do is visualize the relationship between the two quantities. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that this question is sneakily similar to the one I showed you at the beginning. Um, if Angela has 18 fewer hats than Boris, how many hats does Boris have? And a, bar a child who's been trained to bar model will instantly look at the difference between the two lines, which I've illustrated with these dotted lines. And that difference is those three sections there. All right. And interestingly, uh, that means that she has 18 fewer hats. One of the things I like about these um, double sided counters is you can turn those over and I can see. So these two reds match the bottom two reds and I can see the difference is three, three parts. I can visually see that. OK. And I think we often say in maths when we're explaining something in an abstract way on the board. There you go. Do you see? Do you see? And the child goes, no, I don't see. Because they don't, there's nothing to see. So what we have to do is paint pictures for these children until they can paint their own. So now I can see that those are worth um, 18. And oh, hang on. This looks suspiciously like the question before. Well, we've got 18 is uh, these three chunks here. So now I can do, well, what do you know? Each chunk is 18 divided by three, and 18 divided by three is six. So Boris, that's what we have to find out, has five lots of six. And so my thinking goes like this. There you go. Boris has five lots of six, which is uh, 30. And there it is. OK, so well done. I think Kuldeep was first with 30. Uh, a bonus mark for people who put their work in. OK, uh, uh, imagine all, all that the picture has done, all that, that bar model has done is really um, take that English and translate it into maths. And, and that's a really great way to think about bar modeling. What it is, is like a translation tool to pick out from the English the key mathematical ideas uh, and allow you to find the right calculations. That's the crucial thing. Okay, um, 
Right, so uh, let's move on. Now, instead of the rucksack, what I teach children to do is what I call the 10 steps. And you could be forgiven for thinking, well, how can you say 10 steps is easier than six steps? Uh, and that's a fair question. But uh, actually, some of the steps are very similar. Um, but others just make the process easier and more scaffolded for children. So, so let's have a look. Read the question again is the first one. You can't, uh, you can't improve on that. Um, now, this is, a, this is a gold dust tip. Find the single thing it's about. And, you know, any word problem, it boils down to one thing. However much um, fluff and extra information uh, and what I call net curtains are in the way of seeing clearly, you can always boil it down to one very simple thing. And that depends on the question. So, for example, uh, let me go back. Okay, this question is about hats. That's what it's about. It's not about Boris Johnson or Angela Merkel um, or ratios or counters. It's about hats. Okay. And if you can find that single thing, and it's often not as difficult as you think. Um, it will be, it'll be something like um, uh, sweets or um, often it's a unit. Often it's a measurement of unit. For example, uh, dollars or uh, dirhams or yen or pounds. Um, or meters, uh, or seconds, or miles per hour. Um, it's often something like that. So here's, here's a silly example. So it's my birthday uh, on the second of the month, and I have uh, 53 candles, and my uh, cousin is twice my age, and she has 106 candles, and we blow them all out and burn the house down, and the fire brigade come, and uh, it's all very terrible, and we say one candle from the wreckage. How many candles were burned? Now, blimey, there's a whole story, but the one thing it's about is candles. And if you train children every time they look at a word problem, if the first thing you say to them is read the question, and then you give them a minute review, and then you say the second thing is, give me a one word answer. What is this about? That will really transform their confidence in tackling word problems. Because trust me on this, you probably know this in your gut, right? Um, children could do the maths if they could find the maths, all right? It's the, it's the language of the word problem that is so um, confusing, not necessarily the calculation itself. Okay? We're pretty good at teaching calculation as a rule. I think it's finding it. That's the real, real secret. Okay. Now, um, write the answer leaving a gap. This is a golden tip too, okay? This is something they do a lot in Singapore. Um, so going back to this question, um, before I, once I'd read the question, read the question, what's it about? Hats, write the answer leaving a gap. So what's the question? The question is how many hats does Boris have? So I literally write down, or encourage my students to write down depending on age, Boris has, then put a dash, and then put hats, full stop. Now that's really good for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I've nearly done my whole answer already, okay? uh, and psychologically that can really help. Secondly, um, it's very easy. Have you ever done that thing where you, um, you, uh, you're just about to ring someone, and you see a text message is coming from someone else, and you can't remember their uh, website, so you go online and you notice some, someone's just sent you a Twitter notification, and you look on, and you go, oh, hang on a second, and oh, Oh, I, I was just wondering what's happened to my Amazon parcel. And you forget what on earth you were doing in the first place. Now, maybe it's just me, but I suspect a lot of us have that kind of butterfly um, approach to tasks sometimes when we're on the internet, whatever. And children's minds are just the same. Remember, if they're having to go through uh, and develop comprehension of a difficult word problem, they can often forget what they're doing. Have you ever walked into a room? Okay, so tell me, just, I want to put a yes if you've done this, please. Have you ever walked into a room and gone, why am I in here? What did I come in here for? And the only way to find out is to go back out and come back in. Just put yes if you've ever done that. Otherwise, I'll just think it's me going mad. Yeah, it's every day. <laughs> every day, yeah. Okay, look, I, that's pretty good, all right? Uh, it's one of those things. Oh, actually, there's just seven of us, and basically, so we're all good. Okay, oh, there's loads of people. There's some sometimes. Yeah, good. Sometimes is good. Um, so, coffee is probably the answer, right? 
just joking. So, um, right, so it is the same with children and word problems, okay? So if you get lost, it's like, um, I'm sure you know the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. There's that bit of string that you can always unravel and go back to the start. You can follow. So he can go back to the start of the maze because he's left that marker. And children can go back to what it is they're supposed to be doing because they look at their answer. Oh, Boris has dash has. That's what I need to find out without using up too much brain power working it out. OK, so that's a really crucial, um, really crucial step. Step three. Think about which model is appropriate. Um, and that's something that I'm going to show you later on, uh, how to decide that. There's only two questions you ask to decide that. And then draw and label the bars and put a question mark. That's how you actually make your bar. OK. And then eight, use them to find the calculation needed. And to be fair, that's where the bar model is finished. It's done its job. OK. It's absolutely done its job there. Now, calculate the answer. That's just you child doing a calculation. And then, of course, write the answer in the gap. Now, those 10 steps I have found to be the best way of, of teaching uh, children to bar model. And I also was sitting in a cafe a couple of years ago, and I had this idea, which struck me as a bit weird, but I spoke to a printer and had hundreds of these made. Uh, now, if, you, if your children sit um, in groups or around you know, tables or whatever, uh, then these are brilliant because uh, it's the same information, the 10 steps designed clearly, but on three different sides. I don't know if that's uh, clear enough for you to see there. And uh, and, and you just, they're literally, they're, they're A4. Um, you can make your own, you know, you don't, you don't have to get, get them from me, but you can make your own. Uh, and anyone sitting around the table can see the 10 steps. And I find for the first few weeks or months that children are learning to use these tools, these techniques, uh, they are absolutely brilliant, okay? So this is uh, absolutely perfect for, um, for primary school classes, um, to some extent, uh, younger secondary school classes as well. Uh, and I don't, it's not a permanent thing. It's, these steps will become second nature very, very quickly. All right, so I'll tell you where you can get those at the end. Part whole relationship and the product factor relationship. If children are to succeed with bar modeling, you have to have, um, some pre-knowledge instilled. I, I find far too many times, I'm afraid I've seen people go, oh, this looks great, this is great, I'm going to teach my children this tomorrow, and actually you need to prepare the ground, okay? Uh, I'm just looking out my window here, and we've had some uh, lawn, some, some fake grass laid down in our back garden, and it looks great, but the guys did, for the first, for the first week or 10 days, they didn't get anywhere near putting grass down. They had to prepare the ground. And a, and a child's mind is very much like that. Prepare the ground. So here are two diagrams they need to understand. The first one on the left, um, you've probably seen this before. If you haven't seen this before, then um, you will be, uh, you know, you'll be really amazed by this, how simple it is. So we talk traditionally in math about four operations, right? But actually, we can think of those four operations in as two relationships. And the relationship on the left shows addition and subtraction. So I have 17 and I have three, they're my parts. And if I know the parts, I can have the whole, there's the whole 20, right? But if I swing them around, if I know the whole, I, I, for example, say 17 is the whole and three is one of the parts, you can all work out what the other part is. So the relationship doesn't change, but now we're calling it subtraction, okay? So there's the relationship between addition and subtraction, really, really powerful idea. The one on the right, is, uh, is very similar. So the one on the right gives me six related facts. Six times seven is 42, seven times six is 42, 42 divided by six is seven, 42 divided by seven is six, and the two that I don't think get, get kind of mentioned enough are um, one sixth of 42 is seven, and one seventh of 42 is six. And I think it's worth having all six of those in place. Now, if you want to introduce younger children to these ideas, the, the way to introduce the first idea is this idea, the part whole game. I, I like, from trial and, trial, and, uh, trial and improvement, I've worked out that A3 is probably the best size. So print out a few of these on A3 paper, laminate them if you want. Um, and it's really a simple thing. You just literally like uh, roll a dice. Um, 
Uh, notice, by the way, that now the hole is on the right. It really isn't important. Okay, the orientation of this diagram can be any way around. It's the, it's the relationship that's important. So let's say you roll a dice and you've got a two, and I roll a dice and I've got a three, and we put some counters uh, on our respective parts, and then we can slide them all into the box that says hole. Okay, so um, now I can deduce several things. So I wonder if I can put something in it. Just to give you an example of what we could say, and try this. Oh yeah, I can. oh yeah, I can look. So I'm going to write something in the chat box. Oh, that's not working at all. Okay, I can't. I I, I tried. I tried a little experiment there. Um, but let's try. Oh my God! Sends to all three. No, it's not working. Three plus two. Is that going to come up in the chat box? Uh, I'm just going to see if I can do that. Okay, it's not. Same to all. Oh, that looked quite hopeful. No, all right, don't worry. Uh, just an experiment. What I want you to do is, I, I, I was trying to write 3 plus 2 equals 5. Can you see that that diagram will show you 3 plus 2 equals 5? But it can show you an awful lot of other things. Don't forget the, uh, the whole can be split into parts, not just the parts made into whole. We can find a difference. So in the chat box, just write a calculation that you can see. There are there are at least eight that you could go for. While you're typing those in, well done, Kriti, well done, Sam. Yeah. While you're typing those in, let me just address this very interesting. Can this method be used in unitary based problems? Absolutely right, it can. Yeah, we'll come to that. Okay, here we are. Um, look at all these. There's at least eight possibilities you could have gone for there. Um, I want to, I don't know if you can see the top one, three plus two equals five and five equals three plus two. Now, I wonder if any of you, um, if any of you teach six-year-olds, uh, some of them, you'll, you'll know that they're very happy to say three plus two equals five, but they're not always quite as happy to say five equals two plus three because they misunderstand the value of the equal sign, right? They misunderstand that equals means uh, is worth the same as rather than here comes the answer now, okay, or makes, as some of them think. Okay, so uh, there's a whole whole range of possible things children can understand just from this one picture. Okay, Olga likes that, I can see. Okay, right. Um, what about these as well? You can say five is two more than three, five, three is two less than five. So lots of brilliant language. Okay, now let's come on to the meaty bit. These are the four main picture types that you'll see. And if you look at the two on the left, it's where we're talking about parts of a whole. So in the top, the whole has been split into two different parts. In the bottom example, it's been split into three, red, yellow, and blue. And then on the right-hand side, um, we have got uh, this uh, comparison type where, where I'm comparing two different things and we traditionally have more than one model. There are examples where uh, more than one model would serve a purpose and we'll look at that uh, as we go through. Now, you've got two different types. You've got discrete and continuous, okay? Discrete bars isn't a phrase I'm gonna be Googling again in a hurry, but there you go, you live and learn. Whoops, move on. Uh, discrete means all these sections are the same size. So this is ideal for um, what was called unitary method by someone earlier. Okay, and um, uh, it's ideal for that. Uh, ratio questions. Um, it's ideal for very small numbers. So I've got three red lorries and two yellow lorries. How many lorries do I have? That kind of thing. Uh, but basically, for proportional representations and for ratios, it's hard to beat this. Okay, here's the example of the hats five to two. Okay. Uh, and again, now here, this is where the, the sorry the quantities, the blocks are all worth different amounts. Okay, so this might be my um, my bread costs uh, three dollars, my my water costs one dollar, and my eggs cost two dollars. How much did I pay all together? That kind of idea. Okay, but this might be my bread costs twice as much as my eggs, you know, and so on. So uh, it's the same thing, uh, but you're comparing things rather than thinking of them as part of a whole. And the good news is, once you get that, uh, that's really all there is to it. Um, now. There are 
as as ever, there are some pre-teaching tasks. So, so before we before we lay our new lawn, here's the four tasks I recommend um, for children up to the age of seven-ish. The first one is very simple. It's called how many. The benefit of doing these four tasks, I have to be honest, the benefit of these doing these four tasks is so that uh, when you teach them the actual bar, they'll pick it up, boom, like that. Okay, they'll pick it up like that. It's really straightforward. So how many? So you roll a dice. I, you roll a four. You have a, a stick of ten green cubes, and you put four of them together. Okay. I roll a dice. I get two. And I have a stick of orange ones, say, okay. And there we go. So you've got your four, I've got my two, and we put them together and we can say, look, you've got four, I've got two. Uh, all together we have six. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, a four year old child who could count could do that, five year old with a partner. Then we move on to doing exactly the same thing, but this time on those mats. And we increase the language slightly. Okay, so now we're saying, uh, Oh, I've got four. I've got two. My part is four, as you put your four on the uh, circle. The circles wouldn't have those numbers on, by the way, okay, on the map that I showed you earlier. And uh, then oh, my two on. And then we can say, so your part is four, my part is two. And then you slide both parts into the hole. And when you slide them together, don't put an extra six on because then you've got 12 in play, and that's not what we're saying. But move those four and those two into the hole box to say six and you've got uh, the whole is six, and you can use that language. Okay, then put them into threes for this task. Ben, there's Ben, and there's Raj, and there's Ali, and you just say, okay, uh, Ben rolls a three, Raj rolls a one, Ali rolls a four, they all make their sticks, put them together, and this is setting them up for the comparison, right? Uh, the comparison models, and you, Ben says, well, I've got more than Raj, uh, uh, I've, but less than Ali, and Ali said, I've got more than Ben and more than Raj, and Raj can say, I've got less than, both of you and so on. So it's about the comparison. Okay, now draw me is exactly the same, except you do all of them and you just give them a pen uh, or a pencil or a whiteboard, doesn't matter, and they uh, they draw out the things they've done. That's a really important step. Okay? Don't miss that out. You'll notice also that I've introduced here the idea that a whole can be split into um, more than two parts. Okay? And uh, if they're able, they can, they can do that as well. That's not a problem. Doing those tasks will really, really help. Okay. Now, when they're moving to uh, older years, sort of grade three upwards, they need to have understood that number relationship concept. Okay. That's a really important, this idea of undoing. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the language of inverse, okay. the difference, and also multiplicative identities there in that last sentence, relationships. Last two sentences, sorry. Okay, I have twice as much, you have half as much. The three fives of 15. So that's that second sort of triangle diagram that we saw earlier. And then finally, do you understand that if a quarter of something is red, then three quarters of it is not red? So there's language around this that needs to be done. And and I know I know there's a culture sometimes of saying, well, if they're just talking about it, they're not really doing it. Uh, and I couldn't disagree more, to be honest. There is, um, in, in this country, we had a, um, for, for a while, an obsession with you must get lots and lots and lots and lots of writing in the books, but it's not what goes in the books that's really important, it's what goes in the brains, okay? So um, I understand the pressure that some teachers are under, but honestly, um, the, if, you, if they get the language right, they use uh, the proper vocabulary uh, along with the proper imagery, that will really accelerate their learning anyway. Okay, uh, now let's have a look. Um, I'm going pretty quickly, hope that's all right. Uh, for the older children, how many out of? Okay, so this is the same, except now instead of saying you've got four, I've got two, you're saying I've got four out of two. Uh, sorry, I've got four out of uh, six, and uh, you've got two out of six, which leads us neatly onto the next game, which is to say, oh, look, um, fractional sections. Um, uh, there's five all together, uh, I've got three, so that's three fifths. And you've got two, so that's two fifths. And three fifths plus two fifths is five fifths. Um, and this is great because it preempts that awful um, issue that if you teach 10 year olds or nine, you'll know about this or nine year olds, the common mistake of saying three out of five plus two out of five is five out of 10. 
right? There's so many children made that mistake of adding the denominators. But this will help with that. It will help preempt the issue. Free teaching is the first step of mastery. The next one for older children, this is really good because um, it's very similar to what the younger children did. Okay. And uh, so here we go. Ben now says, uh, the difference between mine and Raj's is two. And Raj says, the difference between mine and Ali's is three. Okay, so now they're looking at how, not just they're bigger or smaller, but what is the actual size of the difference? And if you think back to the examples of questions we've looked at so far, that difference turns out to be a really important uh, feature. And then finally, bar modeling backwards. Now, okay, I want you to put a yes in the chat box. Someone's just pointing out two fifths and three fifths is five fifths. Yes, it is. Yes, I'm glad you think that. Uh, I wasn't saying it's five tenths, by the way. I was saying that a lot of children mistakenly put that it's five tenths, just in case I wasn't clear there. Okay, and this helps them avoid that. So bar modeling backwards. So put a yes in the chat box. If you have tried to introduce a pictorial or visual method to children, often about 10 or 11, and they go, why do we have to do this? I don't want to do this. I know the answer. I can do it already. Um, has anyone hit that challenge? Because I get asked that to solve that problem quite a lot. So give me a yes if that's uh, in your experience. <laughs> okay, yeah, a lot of people saying yes there. Not surprising. I just got a message. Was it speak, speak more slowly? Yes, it was. I was going too fast. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will go more slowly. Um, I've got so much to tell you. That's the only thing. All right. So I've developed this thing called bar modeling backwards, and it really helps children learn the method, even, even if they're not initially convinced. So what I do is I ask them to have a um, make a line of three yellows and five blues. The color isn't important here, to be honest. Okay. And, uh, and I say, right, imagine I've got some grains of rice. I'm going to put um, 10 grains of rice in every box. Oh, by the way, cubes don't look like boxes, but I discovered an amazing optical visual illusion, I don't know what to call it, that tricks my brain into making these cubes into empty boxes. And watch, this is like magic. All you do is put empty lines in like this. Just vertical lines. Now, don't those yellow ones look like empty boxes? It's so cool. You probably knew that years ago, but art was never my strength at school. So I'm, I only learned this recently and I'm super pathetically excited. Same on the blue ones. Let's just make those uh, from cubes into boxes. Yeah, Christopher hadn't seen that either. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Now, um, this is very cool. Okay. So I want you to say I've got some grains of rice in each box and the same number in each of those eight boxes. And here's what I don't deliberately trick my students. OK, this, that's not what this is about at all. I'm not trying to trick them, but I am trying to make them pay attention to what I want. So I'll say, supposing there's 10 grains of rice in each of those eight boxes, okay, 10 grains of rice in each box. Um, how do I find the total in the yellow line? And they'll almost always say 30. And if they do, I'm really happy because it allows me to make the point I want to make. And I go, no, wrong. And they look horrified. Okay, <laughs> what? And they look all confused. And it's, it's hard because as a teacher, you don't want to confuse your children, but trust me, this one's worth it. I go, no, listen again. So there's 10 in every, every individual box, 10 grains of rice. How do I find how many there are in the yellow line? And I keep going until one of them realizes the answer is you have to multiply 10 by three. Okay, because the question wasn't how many are there in the yellow line, it's how can I find out how many there are in the yellow line? And this is why there's a huge problem in um, math class math lessons with the same old children answering the questions, getting it right, and the children who were confused about why that was the answer are still confused. So they're none the better. They're, they haven't learned anything from that conversation. I hope that makes sense. So, for example, if I, if I said, so there's 10 in each, how do I find out how many there are in the yellow? And, and you're still thinking about it, and someone goes, 30! And you go, correct. The teacher goes, correct. And you go, well, why? Okay. Can you explain? And then maybe. But what if the explanation came before the 30 ever came? 
And this has really transformed the way children engage with me in a class because children um, put up their hand more or whatever method you use, they'll, they'll engage more if they know that there isn't just this like quick calculator kid going to shout out answers all the time. So I need to warn you, they will get quite cross at this. So then I might say another question like, okay, supposing there's, um, again, I'm going to put the same number of grains of rice in, in all of the boxes. Okay, there's a hundred grains of rice in the blue line. How do I find out how many there are in each blue box? Okay, why don't you guys have a go at answering that in the chat box, please? I'll say it again. There's a hundred grains of rice in the blue line. How do I work out the number in each blue box? So I'm going to look at the comments and see if I've caught anybody out. I've caught a few people out. I've caught a few people out, but uh, full marks to the person who put, or the people who put a uh, hundred divided by five. Yeah. So if you put twenty and you were in my class, I'd have gone, nope. <laughs> okay. It's not because I didn't say how many are in each box. Do you see? I told you it's annoying. I said, how would I find it out? Because I want all the children to benefit from this conversation, and they're all going to benefit much more if they hear someone say, ah, oh, you have to divide a hundred by five than if you just say 20. So once you've got that idea in your head, um, it's much easier to teach and learn bar modeling. The next thing I do is look at the difference, okay? And supposing I now said, um, okay, there are 100 more grains of rice in the blue line than the yellow line. So how many grains of rice in the yellow line? How would I find that out? Okay. And here, what I'm looking for is children who go 100 divided by 2 multiplied by 3. Okay. And I'm going to praise that child more than the child who says 150, sir. Okay. Because it's, if that child says 150, no one's really gaining from that experience. But if I force them to say 100 divided by 2, which gives me what one box is, multiplied by 3, and that's really helping with the understanding. Okay, that's the crucial thing. Now, if you if you have a child who still refuses because they think you will only value them if you if they give you the right solution, then there's one more trick you can do. Okay, which is to make up such a difficult number they won't be able to do it. So if I say there are um, 73 trillion grains of rice in every box. How many are there in the blue line? <laughs> then, then their their only real way to answer is to say seventy three trillion times five. Uh, so that's a quite a nice little way to keep it keep it amusing for them. Okay, so that's bar modelling backwards. Now let's look at some examples. I think we're really going to zip through how this actually looks now. Most people I've noticed will jump straight into bar models, but I. I like to give everyone the ideas first, and then we can zip through those questions really straightforwardly. Um, one of my <clears throat> issues when I was when I turned forty, I decided to start take up running. See how that was as a sport, and uh, I, I bought some running shoes, and I I couldn't believe how much easier they made the running. But I also realised that I still had to do the running. It was still me doing it. They just made it a lot more comfortable for me and helped me do it. Okay, and bar models the same. All right, it won't, it won't do your calculations for you, it'll just help you find the calculations. Right, now, here's how you choose which of those four types of diagram you're probably needing. Just have a look at this, it's, it's quite straightforward if you look at it for a moment. So, I'm gonna try and decide what to do. Um, okay, the, the two questions I ask are, does it involve fractions or several equal amounts, like ratios. Okay, and the second question is, is it about comparing different things? Okay, that's, those are the two questions you need to ask yourself. So, if it involves fractions or several equal amounts, we're gonna go up to the top half and it'll be these top two images, the discrete ones, okay? If not, we're gonna go to the bottom two where we just have continuous ones. And continuous, remember, just means the blocks can be any size, they don't all have to be the same size, okay? It is actually possible to mix them, but not in this webinar, okay? We'll, we'll leave that for another time. Now, once I've decided whether it's top half or bottom half, I then ask, is it about comparing things? If it is, I'll need more than one bar. 
If it isn't, I won't. And guess what? That's it. That's it. That's how you choose the right model. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples now. Just so you see, now you've done that. Now we've done all the groundwork. How really simple this is. So let's start with someone for young children. What was that first step? Oh yeah, read the question. Second step, what's it all about? Ah, it's not about my uncle, it's not about my aunt, it's not about who has the most, it's about one thing, hats. Oh, okay, right, the answer leaving a gap. My aunt has dash hats. Okay, this is a comparison. So I'm gonna choose to draw it like this, and I put my question mark. Okay, here's my uncle with four, here's my aunt with four, and then another three. Calculation is four plus three. Okay, there you go. That's the kind of how easy it is. So although those 10 steps look, oh my gosh, that's a lot of steps. They aren't really. I love that you're all telling me it's seven hats. Well done. Thank you very much. Oh, great stuff. Oh, it's good. It's more fun when you join in. Okay, give yourselves a pat on the back. Right, here's Rajesh and Kathy. Uh, if anyone on the call is from Brunei, then um, you should know that one of my two favorite schools in the world is in Brunei, and these guys um, used to run this school. So uh, I won't name it just in case, but uh, yeah, uh, this is a trick question about them. Now, I've read the question. Um, this is not about Rajesh and Kathy, is it? It's not about Brunei, it's not about running, it's about meters. The one thing it's about is meters. So Kathy has run dash meters further than Rajesh. Okay, so this is definitely a comparison, and it's going to probably look like this. And I've done it kind of deliberately, like not very neat, because um, <laughs> you're still putting the answers, you lovely people. Okay, a uh, special, special mention to Shaden Al Masri, who's put 34 minus 20, and so is Ranveer. Okay, so you get a full marks because you're showing the method. <laughs> okay, once a teacher, always a teacher, I guess. All right, and now I can see that the calculation is 34 minus 20. Yeah, I'm, at this stage, I'm not really bothered that it's 14. I'm bothered that it's 34 minus 20, because that's the job of the bar, is to show you that it's 34 minus 20. Okay, Tika, he worked in the same school, probably still does, lovely guy. He picks five flowers from his garden. How many flowers he picked after a week? Well, if I've got this idea of drawing lots of blocks of five, it's probably going to look like this. Notice my question mark. Okay. So it's five plus five plus five plus five plus five plus five plus five, or five multiplied by seven. Yeah. Okay. Um, now this is interesting. I gave this to my uh, son when he was seven to see what he would do with it, and um, and this is what he did with it. I thought it was really nice. There's his four t-shirts. He put them out in blocks, equal blocks. He's put four in each, and he's even done a, like a fraction for division. So that's nice. Okay. Um, Right, now this is interesting, 12 children at a party, a quarter go home, how many still at the party? So this is kind of like, hmm, quarters, so that's going to be discrete, I can draw something with four quarters, literally chop one off, and what's left is the question mark, so I've got 12 divided by four times three here. Okay, we've just got time for a few more from slightly older kids, uh, here's kind of what I'd expect 7 to 11s to be able to do, 8 to 11s maybe. So here are three guys off for a cycle ride. Now you see all the numbers are bigger and different, so we're not going to use discrete blocks, we're going to use continuous blocks in these bars. And again, now what's, I, I like this one because there's, this just shows that um, it's more about what the child understands than what my dogma is, because that's a perfectly good answer, right? There's uh, three bars, okay? And the question mark goes like along the right-hand side to suggest that we add them all up. But what if, um, what if I express the total journey like that? That's interesting, isn't it? Now, as you see, I've got a, um, I haven't got a comparison. I've just got a continuous uh, stream there, but that's okay. I've treated that as three parts of a whole. And can you see that both of them lead to the same calculation, which as Shaden has put, sorry if I said your name wrong there, Shaden, uh, 18 plus 14 plus eight, well done. Okay. Um, right, I'm going to skip that one because we're nearly out of time. So I'm just going to show you um, that sometimes things change over time. All right, so here's, um, here's Bob and Wendy and their builders. 
and they share out a box of 200 nails. Now look at that, this is so much words to assail you there, just take a moment. There's a lot, right? There's a lot, oh, I don't know. And now you notice that in this example, something changes. Something changes in this example. Um, and often you'll find that you have to draw your bar twice um, or even move something on it, and that's fine. You know, some math problems, things change. So it starts like this, right? There's 200 nails. Bob has more than Wendy. How many did Wendy have to start with? But the thing that we haven't included is the fact that he gives her 34 nails. So let's just move and do that. And now suddenly this question doesn't become quite so hard. Okay, I can see that she must have had 100 minus 34 because she's obviously got 100 now. So imagine doing that with a diagram and imagine doing it without a diagram, not you as yourself as, a, as an adult, okay, um, but actually this ability to kind of, yeah, as you said there in the chat, working backwards from this and here is the diagram that allows children. So next time you say, can you see, do you see? you're actually giving them a picture that they can see. So that's it, a very quick run through um, of an introduction to bar model, but not just the how you do it, but with the key principles of a bar model, okay? The, the why you should do it, uh, what you need to do to make it successful. Now, um, I did say that I had a, a gift, which is um, I'm offering these things half price, um, that's that's to the UK, but I can still do something for you if you want me to ship them abroad. Um, you don't actually need the code webinar one. You just literally go to my website, and uh, I think I've made them. I think just five pounds or something for a set of ten, set of five. Anyway, go and have a look. There's the link. Um, that's all from me. I'm going to hand back to uh, Reiner now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was really engaging and I think a lot of the teachers, um, bar the slightly connectivity issues, um, really enjoyed your session. So you can see some of the comments here. Um, just in terms of some of the links that we have here, feel free to join us on um, our social media links that you can see there. There will be a webinar recording of this session available on our Macmillan Education International Curriculum YouTube page. So do log into that to see previous recordings and also to um, view Andrew's um, recording. Hopefully later this week, um, I will have that uploaded. Also, um, we have a home learning content page that you can have a look at for additional resources for primary maths, literacy and science as well. Do email us if you have any questions. And in terms of CPD certificates, the PowerPoint presentation, they will be provided hopefully within two weeks. Please bear with us as we are running webinars every week for the next uh, month or so. So there may be a delay in that, but um, it will definitely be sent out to you. So thank you so much again. If there are, are any questions, we'll just have a quick look now, uh, but we will take maybe about two questions or so. Um, and have a look. Thank you. Perfect. I think there's a, a lot of um, thank yous for you, Andrew. I think it was a really active session, so we will leave oh. it there. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so I like much. I mes like mesmerising. I've never been called mesmerising before. That's it's a lovely word, isn't it? Yes. Thank you, I Yash. I think I might just Sal. use that as a tag for uh, Andrew's next session. I might introduce him as the mesmerising <laughs> Andrew Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> perfect. <Mesmerizing>. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much oh, to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Have a lovely day. Please stay safe. And uh, hopefully we might be able to see you in person. Um, when we come to some of your regions to do presentations. So um, watch out for those as well. Take care of everyone and stay safe. Bye. Bye.